I'd been working maintenance for a few years by the time I got done with college. Mostly just garbage pickup and stuff like that at apartment complexes my dad was in charge of in central Arizona. The pay was okay, and I did manage to get my own little place where I was living with my girlfriend. It was all pretty good in its own right, but I wasn't making too terribly much, and we'd never been able to take a vacation or anything on our own. It was on a Wednesday when I saw an ad in my city newspaper for a pool boy in a little place a few miles out of town for almost twice what I was making doing all the other maintenance work I already was. I almost immediately called the number the paper mentioned and was greeted by a calm sounding man, probably in his mid forties. When I inquired about the job, he seemed to become even happier and we set up a meeting time. That Saturday, we met at his place, a big, open house with lots of windows and all the latest appliances. He seemed to be a pretty nice guy, rich too, obviously. When I asked why he was offering so much just to monitor his pool, he replied that he had just let his last guy go and his pool always needed surveillance because he had a young daughter and she had a lot of friends that sort of thing. I accepted the job almost instantly and was gladly up at his place right after my two weeks notice passed at my dad's. Work was pretty smooth for the first few weeks, my new employer being so much more understanding of circumstances than my old man was allowed to be due to the rules and regulations every employee had to follow at his complex. I could go in and cool off when it seemed too hot outside, and he always kept his fridge stocked with water. It all seemed exceedingly comfortable. I would occasionally make small talk with the maid. She couldn't speak English very well, but one day when I asked her, she told me that the boss was a cosmetic surgeon, obviously a very wealthy one at that. As a personal rule, I'm generally against that kind of stuff, and admittedly grimaced at the prospect of working for someone whose money came from boob jobs. Still, he seemed like a nice, settled-in family man, and the pay was good, so I let it be. About two months in, I was clearing some sand and other sorts of residue out of the bottom of the pool, faintly hearing the sound of a piano from inside. The doc's window was wide open, and he was overseeing his daughter practicing. I try not to be a snoop, but work was taking longer than expected, and the music was pleasant, until it suddenly stopped. I could hear the doc calmly explaining to the daughter what she did wrong, but in an instant she started screaming at him that she wanted to stop. It hadn't occurred to me until then that she had been practicing the entire morning. This in mind, I couldn't help but listen in just a little over the sound of my pool vacuum. He started shouting and threatening to ground her, to take her dolls away. I then caught something that I didn't quite understand. Something about her... Big Barbie, or something like that. When I began to hear the music again, I just went back to cleaning out the pool, trying to forget what I had just heard. Though I tried to make good on this attempt, I decided I'd be on the watch for this kind of thing in the future. I know that parents snap at their children and all, but if this turned into abuse, someone was going to hear about it. Sometime thereafter, I was inside getting a drink when I got a good look at a photo on the refrigerator I had never noticed before, showing the doctor, his daughter, and two other women, one in her 40s or 50s, and the other a teenager. Judging by the doc's youngest daughter, it looked 
fairly recent. I asked the maid about it, and in the best broken English she could give me, she said that the older woman was the doctor's wife, the younger, his older daughter. I hated to keep asking questions given her difficulty speaking to me, but I pressed on just a little more to ask why I had never seen them around. Now with difficulty, not only speaking, but recalling, she told me that the doctor's daughter was killed in a car crash a few years ago. His wife killed herself shortly thereafter. This shocked and horrified me. I suddenly couldn't help but feel a new sense of compassion for the doctor and his daughter. Soon, as I was hydrated, I went right back to work, wondering if I'd ever seen much sign of grief from the two. Maybe that's why the doctor was so uptight about some things with his daughter. Maybe that's why she clung to her toys the way she did. I cleaned out bits of Barbie toys from the pool on what seemed like a weekly basis. It was a lot to take in. Time went on and my work continued. I had never imagined doing what I did as a year-round job. I used to live in the Midwest. Pools usually close around Labor Day, but down here they were open all the time and the doc's kid and her friends just kept coming over. One day, doing my usual work, I noticed a large splotch at the bottom of the pool for what it must have been the third time. I was irritated and reluctantly accepted normal chlorine just wasn't going to do the trick. I had to shock the thing using a form of super chlorine, several times stronger than the average stuff. I checked the doc's notes and he did indeed confirm that he had some of the stuff I needed. It was kept in the basement. Seemed like an odd place for it, but I digress. Maybe it was just to keep it out of his daughter's hands. Speaking of the doc's daughter, my eye caught her and a couple of her friends about to jump in the water. I had to shout at them to stop, as she threw a fit at me for doing so. I just figured that the splotch in the pool would be a bacterial breeding ground. I was not letting little kids in it. I found my maid friend again, now frantic to make the pool clean for the boss's daughter, and asked her where the basement was. She responded with a confused look. I tried several other phrases, my high school Spanish long lost, until she recognized the word cellar. She led me outside after I mentioned it and pointed me to a dingy little trap door in the ground connected to the house right next to the hose. I had never noticed it there before and it was tightly bound with what appeared to be shiny new chains very little dirt on them. I tried to ask her how I was supposed to open it, but we both lacked the vocabulary to communicate properly. I was about to bitterly accept defeat, leave the doc a note, and tell him to not worry about paying me that day, until his daughter walked up to me. She said that she had a key to the cellar. I was very confused by this right from the get-go and even more so when she mentioned that I couldn't tell her dad that she did. But I wanted to get back to work, so I agreed to her conditions. I was in the dimly lit cellar a few minutes later, and she shouted at me to not play with any of her toys. Why did she have toys down here? Was this where the doc kept her stuff when she was in trouble? Was that why she wasn't supposed to have a key? I fumbled around in the dark for a while. The light from outside only helping me so much, desperately looking for a light switch. As I continued to wander around, I ultimately felt myself pushing up against something. It felt like a wall, but there was no weight behind it. Not entirely sure what I was doing, I pushed against it and suddenly toppled into another passage. Confused, disorientated, and growing increasingly frightened, 
I felt around for a switch again and quickly found one on the wall. Despite the short time I had spent in the cellar, I was briefly blinded when the lights came on, but more so when I got a good look at the room. This was not some sort of dingy cellar I had walked into. The thing extended beneath the house and was filled. To my shock and slight disturbance, there was oversized pink and white furniture. My jaw was agape as I searched around, finding a fully functional bathroom, den, everything. The rooms were much smaller than they had been upstairs, but they were still comparable to a decent hotel's. Why on earth did the doctor have all this down here? I wandered through just a little more, too shocked by what I had seen to turn back, when I came across a bedroom. Of course, everything was pink and huge, and this room even included a closet full of clothes. But the most notable feature present was what appeared to be a giant cardboard box sitting in the room's center. In sloppy handwriting, the box read, My Favorite Barbie. I didn't want to open the box. I swore at myself for dropping down and grabbing the bottom of the cardboard cube. My consciousness screaming to put the damn thing down and find whatever I had come for. I couldn't even remember anymore, but I just had to know what this was all for. I wish I'd never have taken that job. I wish I had never gone into that cellar. I wish I'd never opened that fucking box. I screamed and scrambled away the instant I saw what I did. Standing before me, at almost my exact height, was a Barbie doll. I struggled to catch my breath as I stared at the thing. I was full of doubt that Mattel had ever made anything like this. But the likeness was nearly perfect to the dolls I had seen around the house. Her eyes were wide open and green. She had long blonde hair and bright pink lips, smiling. Still trying to take it in, I noticed that the doll was naked. It had oversized breasts without any nipples, and that seemingly impossible figure that led down to a solid patch of skin where the genitals would be. Heart pounding. I noticed something along the doll's back. I slowly went beside it to take a look, seeing a large, bulbous thing sticking out of its back, almost like a button. Letting curiosity defeat me once again, I gently pressed it. Help me! The doll started screaming in a shrill voice. I ran from it towards the door, not even so much shocked by the scream as what I had felt. I had touched flesh. No, I thought. No, no, no. That was impossible. This thing appeared to gleam like plastic a moment ago. That wasn't real. But as I continued to back away, my fears were confirmed. I could see the doll's chest expanding and contracting. The doll was breathing. The doll was real. My jaw was dropped, tears starting to well up in my eyes. This was not happening. What the fuck was I even looking at? Struggling to accept all that was before me, I darted around the room. I could hear footsteps over my pounding heart. There was the doctor, 
just a few feet behind me, holding a syringe. Well then, he muttered, I guess you found our playroom. I gently slid a hand into my pocket as I demanded that he tell me what was going on. Ensuring that he couldn't see, I managed to warm out my cell phone from my pocket. Without a hint of sadness or remorse in his voice, the doctor told his tale, chilling me to the bone as I managed to trigger the video camera on my phone. The doctor had told me that he desired the same thing any other parent does. To have the perfect child. He told me that everything seemed to be going well with his older daughter, but she started to rebel in her teenage years. Her grades started to slip in high school, and he caught her having sex on the living room couch. He was so overwhelmed by her misbehavior that he was ready to give up on her entirely. He told me that he was convinced that if he pampered his younger daughter, surely she would behave correctly. A Christmas before last, he asked her what she wanted. She said she wanted a big Barbie doll that could do anything she told it to and that would play with her all the time. The doctor told me how he spent a month and a half planning what he'd do, planning how to pamper his younger and punish his older. My wife found out at one point. All for the best though. I was planning on bringing some fat and collagen home from work, but I think she worked out much more smoothly. <laughs> he told me how he staged the disappearance of his daughter while he sedated and put her under the knife. He spent over a week getting everything just right before he surprised his younger daughter with the playmate she always wanted. In exchange for just being my perfect little angel. My jaw was slack, too horrified of it all to move. Why was he going on and on? Was he bragging about this disgusting accomplishment? He talked and talked about how she'd been living off juices and purees he made, how her eyes were glass and hand-painted, how he tried to leave in the originals, but she cried too much, and her younger pointed out that her toy didn't blink, and how she had little chips throughout her body, and that it would give her a brutal shock if she used her vocal cords and he didn't press the button first. You're gonna fry for this, you sick son of a bitch! I shouted. You! What the fuck is wrong with you? Well, of course. I wouldn't tell you all this if I was gonna let you leave, he said with a smile. I've needed a matching Ken doll, you know. I tried to swallow, but my mouth was too dry. Now, come here and take your medicine. He was unexpectedly strong and managed to tackle me quickly, knocking the phone out of my hand. The needle came deathly close to my neck, but despite the momentary advantage, I had the weight edge to force him off of me and grab my phone. As much as I wanted to help the poor mutilated girl, I had to save myself first. Running as fast as I could out of the basement and into my car, I have never driven as fast as I did in my life. I pulled out of the doctor's driveway and slammed the gas the moment I shifted into drive. About a minute later, I could hear the sound of a shotgun firing in the distance. I managed to make it back into town, cars everywhere, long before I could see anything of the doctor in my rear view. I pulled into the police station and flipped open my phone searching out the evidence to incarcerate this insane bastard. Only to find that my SD card had been destroyed when he tackled me. 
I had nothing to give the police but my testimony. And even in my head, I knew it was too mad to be true. I drove to my parents' place that night, the house empty. I assumed that they were gone on a date or something and searched around my dad's room and found his revolver. I don't remember much more of that night, but my girlfriend tells me I was extremely on edge, constantly looking out the window. Three days after my horrifying discovery, I drove back to the house, armed, ready to pay the doctor back for his crime against humanity. When I arrived at the house, however, it was entirely abandoned. No sign of anyone anywhere. And when I checked the horrors of the cellar, the doll and its box were gone. I found one of the doctor's business cards while snooping and made a call to his office that night. The receptionist said that he had left on a very short notice with no real explanation. That was about a year ago. I've spent I don't know how many nights sleepless with what I had experienced in that basement. I am only mentioning this now because on YouTube.com's newsfeed, I found an article about a pool boy in southern Florida mysteriously disappearing. In the video attached, there were tearful testimonies from his family and his employer, speaking all the while while his daughter was within audible range. She was bragging to all of her friends that she was getting a Ken doll for her favorite Barbie.